Welcome everybody to a, what appears to be a Dragon's Den episode. And with me as always is my good buddy Jarus. He's going to be riding shotgun in this one because it's pretty much just a, a KSP episode. So in this one, this kind of is a it's part two to the Star Citizen thrust thing. And it's less about Star Citizen and more just about ships in general. And this is actually a successful SSTO, though I don't have this current version yet. I kind of went and did something else with it. Uh, and it can fly up from the ground all the way up into orbit and then deorbit and land uh, with actually a little bit of fuel left. It does have a cargo bay, but the fuel levels on it are pretty tight. And unfortunately, I don't think it can really take anything to orbit besides crew. Now we're on the runway, do a little bit of pre-flight checks. I made sure to leave a lot of the mech jab stats open so you guys can see all the things, especially the weight. I thought that was important. And uh, there's an interesting little, I guess, not really a bug, but a, a thing. When you're on the runway, if you have, uh, I think it's friction on the front wheel, you will wiggle around. And if you remove the friction, you don't wiggle around. But it also means you can't turn with the wheel. So after a little bit of a wobbly start, we easily get it up into the takeoff. Now, one of the cool things uh, about this ship is, I mean, for KSP, it's not really uh, anything new. It's the rapier engines, which are based off of the Saber engine, which was a hybrid uh, jet and rocket engine that was um, kind of prototyped or at least drawn up back in the 1960s. Uh, a little bit more work was done on this kind of concept in the 80s, but I believe they just kind of deemed it either too complicated or, you know, too cutting edge to, to build. Um, and the most interesting thing about this is um, they started rebuilding these, um, or maybe not building is the correct word, but they're doing more research on them. Uh, that was, I believe, a UK company. I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but it started back in 2008. And they are actually going to be building these engines, and we might see them as soon as 2020. I wonder if they're going to make like a new uh, space shuttle or kind of based on these kind of engines. I, I think that's kind of the idea. There's several SSTO programs going on, plus the SLS, which is the NASA's uh, new uh, uh, capsule-based rocket. Yeah. One thing about the ship is you see I have the middle engine here. And while the hybrid engines, the sabers, or not sabers, <laughs> that's the real one, the rapiers, um, is they aren't as efficient as that middle engine. Though you could argue that, oh, I'm just dragging up a, th uh, you know, a fifth engine, that's extra weight and stuff. But it pretty much pays for itself with the slightly better fuel efficiency and quite a bit better thrust. So it's about like one and a half of those uh, rapier engines, but it's burning more efficiently. So it'll actually make it so it goes further and farther. And all these engines do have a three degree of gimbal, which gives them a little bit more control surfaces when they're in space. So once we get up to an altitude where we basically don't have any more air, we can swap them over to the rocket mode. And you go from having like 30 or something to almost 180. So it's quite a bit better though. Again, they're not super efficient engines, but that last little kick is more than enough to bring you up into a decent enough orbit that your single engine in the back will more than cover it. Uh, the downside of having four is you are bringing a lot of extra weight, but the tolerance of these SSTOs is, is there's a very, very slim margin where they either work or they don't work. And this one's a little on the bottom side, but it still works. So we're pretty much in space at this point. Just have a little bit of small burning here to circularize our orbit. Now, in KSP, for those who don't know, it's about one third ish scale. So your atmosphere ends around 70,000 uh, meters up and uh, Earth's is about 10 times higher than that 
though you can be in parts of the upper atmosphere and still technically be in orbit, though you are slowly being dragged down, even if you're in a high orbit, you still need to readjust things. You don't have that in KSB, and that's, I think, just kind of a game mechanic to make it simpler. And honestly, I'm okay with that. So, we've burned almost 20 tons of fuel just to get up here, and that's just leaving the atmosphere. Uh, so, I mean, that's half of our total weight. It's a lot of fuel. So, we're going to skip the deorbit burn because it's kind of pointless. So, here we're lining up to make sure that we're not going to burn up on Rantry. We deploy the air brakes because those will be pretty important for slowing down. And we hit the time acceleration because it's going to take a while to get down. I usually do the four times physics acceleration until I hit Rantry effects. Because I don't know if it's still true or not, but there used to be a bug that if you were doing a physics acceleration while, you know, hitting atmosphere, you would actually slide further through the atmosphere than you were supposed to because the game was skipping physics calculations. And so what would happen is you'd be going faster and faster, lower and lower in the atmosphere, and you would start getting higher reentry effects because it was skipping calculations. So you were basically not being slowed down. Oh, that'd be a mess. Yeah, I remember it blew me up a few times, and it, it's, it's it, the first time it happens. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> you didn't do that before. No, it's uh, I don't I don't know how recent it was. I think it was one in the in the older game. I'm not sure if it still does it or not. So, one thing that I think is interesting here. Again, we'll compare this with real Earth here in a second, but we're doing. Over two kilometers every, bleh, every two kilometers every second, and uh, that's a little bit lower than Kerbin's orbital speed. I think it's like 35, 37. Um, but Earth's actually is 11 uh, kilometers per second, which is what your orbital speed is. So when you're talking about the difference between KSP and and Earth, I think that's the biggest difference is uh, your re-entry speed or your orbital speeds because 11 kilometers every second is a little bit faster than like three and a half. You're taking that heat right to the edge. Look at that. Yeah, that's the thing about the air brakes is they not really designed for this, I don't think, but you can kind of tap them on and off so they're not getting the direct heat and they will slightly cool down. But you can push it too much, where even opening them a little bit will burn them right off. So when they start getting really high in the red, you just have to shut them off and just, you know, rely on the regular uh, shock effects to slow you down. Now, is this a, does this craft kind of come in at this speed always, or do you just, do you just kind of come in hot? Uh, for the recording, I did this on purpose. Normally, what you'd want to do is you'd want to be more like at a 30-degree angle because that you're presenting more of the bottom of the craft to yeah. slow down but i was like i wonder if i can just go full blast which is not really recommended but another problem i have with uh when i make sts when they make sstos is um they they don't control very well when they are low on fuel uh, and here uh, i'm knocking down the air brakes for their maximum breakage because they will actually, the ones on the bottom will clip the ground because they're very, very close to where the wheels are. So this way, if I hit the brakes, it'll turn on the air brakes and the wheel brakes, but I won't break off the air brakes on the runway. Yeah, it's always a good thing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if DCS shows anything, I know how to brake landing gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely have my diploma in that too. Yeah, another thing, uh, again, this is taking real world uh, mechanics, but I believe it pretty much directly translates over into KSP. Um, it's just a smaller scale. We were going hypersonic speeds around Mach 10 on our re-entry, and um, once you kind of start, just you know, stop being on fire. Uh, like right now, we're probably going only like about Mach 1, um, but still, I mean, we were coming in crazy fast. What you need is a tack hand system so you can get a proper lineup to the runway. Yeah, I kind of screwed this one up. Uh, and it's funny too, because actually, um, when I was recording this one part, uh, <laughs> my dad came and was asking me stuff. So I was actually flying while distracted for a, you know, about 
three or four minutes of this episode <laughs> or this uh, this landing here. It does <laughs> glide really well, though. Yeah, this is probably one of the best SSTOs I've actually made. And, you know, considering how much time I have in this game, it's kind of sad that I've only made one or two that were actually pretty decent. <laughs> Well, you should experiment and try some other uh, other kinds because these, these these seem to be some of the. I mean, most of what I've seen when you fly in, in Kerbal a lot of times is pretty wobbly, but this this looks just as this is solid as a rock. Yeah, I'm actually working on a, a larger version of a modification to this. So, going slightly off topic for the context of this video, this design. I took and I refined it a little bit and I turned it into a nuclear powered ship and when I say that I mean it had nuclear engines which only need the liquid fuel they don't need oxidizers so you can kind of simplify your craft but I couldn't make it fly in this configuration because those engines are big and they are heavy they're about uh, four tons each and the the rapier engines here are like one and a half. That's a huge difference. And uh, the engine on the back, I think, is only like half a ton. So it was incredibly heavy. No matter how many engines I put on there, it would either A, run out of fuel, or B, it'd be too heavy to get into orbit. So me being who I am and KSP being what it is, instead of making the design better, I just bolted a big rocket onto the back with wings, and that made it into space. <laughs> <laughs> If first you don't succeed, bolt something on there. <laughs> yeah, add, add more SRBs. Uh, but I'm working on a a variant of that, which is more like the space shuttle, quite a bit bigger, obviously. But in the cargo bay, which is larger than this one, I actually have a large refinery and uh, ore storage tank, so we can land on a planet and then deploy miners and then mine the ore there and uh, refill its fuel. You better pull and, up a little bit. It's about to get ugly. No, nah, it's totally fine. I can't even see the shadow yet. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about the, the larger one is the very first uh, version that I made, uh, it actually could get into space just with the rocket engines. I didn't even put any uh, rapiers or anything on it because it was just so big and fast. It's like, wow, this is the easiest SSTO I've made, except for it's only half done. <laughs> Now this, well, you're 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 coming down actually, pretty lightly. This should be a nice smooth touchdown. Yeah, I'm only a hundred meters per second. Of course, the the, the inter I, it, does does Kerbal support like stick at all or? Uh, I've heard it does, but I don't know how to do it because that's something I've always wanted to that do. That was nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I this was all one take. I mean, Jars has seen the video, um, and you know he trusts me, but I did all of this. When one mission, one take, no quick saves, no quick loads. I oh, accidentally hit the gear button and. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll do it. But uh, I, I was very pressed, and I was for sure. I'm like, I'm gonna crash this on reentry because I always crash these things. <laughs> That's kind of the fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and here we have my uh, size comparison. I always do. I always get the Kerbal out of there, but the. <laughs> The ladder isn't quite where it needs to be. We'll just we'll just put it that way. <laughs> well, now it's officially a Kerbal mission. <laughs> <laughs> He's perfectly fine. He's fine, folks. He's a trained professional. Don't do this at home. I, I want I want to rename a Kerbal uh, one of the Kerbin, uh, Kerbals a, a Super Dave because I think that would be so perfect. I can do that. This is basically the same craft, but I've added on some rocket engines on the side. And these are kind of modeled after the space shuttle, but not really. They're about 120 uh, kilonewtons of thrust each, though you're not going to get all 120 in the launch pad because atmosphere. So it's about 400 total. And as you can see, instantly, that's not enough to lift this thing up. And we're a little bit heavier, you know, they're pretty heavy engines were so what 48 tons with all the fuel and 400 kilonewtons of force isn't enough to lift this off the ground like at all once we burn enough fuel of course it will eventually lift off and it'll be pretty controllable because the rocket engines are quite powerful and i think you had mentioned that kerbal doesn't really account for uh 
like how to disperse is just measures the center of uh, of gravity, like on the on the, uh, on the on the vehicles, right? Um, this probably would work in the real world, but I don't know if it'd be as stable as it is in KSP. Yeah, just because of the nature of atmosphere and things. Yeah, well, I, I yeah, they definitely have them that close together. I don't think there'd be a whole lot of stability. But yeah. uh, the the concept is the same, though, really. Yeah. This one um, is more of a traditional uh, VTOL craft. It has jet engines as opposed to rocket engines, which makes its VTOL much more efficient because, you know, we're talking about ISPs of like 4,000 as opposed to ISPs of like uh, 200. But the problem with the jet engines is they aren't as powerful as the uh, rockets. And I'm going to turn off infinite propellants so that, you know, I'm not cheating. <laughs> Um, but these engines, I believe, were about 120 with afterburners. Uh, and there's only three of them, and they're in that convenient little cargo hold. <laughs> so, I mean, it's. I was actually kind of surprised, honestly. I figure, oh, well, you know, once I turn the afterburner on, you know, it'll have no problem. Uh, but again, I mean, we're working with a craft that's almost 48 tons. Um, it doesn't really want to fly like this. No, no, not at all. Uh, but, I mean, I assume you can take off a lot quicker with that kind of lift underneath the ship, but... Yeah, it, what it does is it's giving us, um, I guess, a little bit of... Jeez, what's, what's a good word for this? Uh, we're not being affected by gravity as much. Therefore, there's a higher takeoff speed, or rather a lower takeoff speed. Which, if I can get all my engines on, you will see me do that. Well, you're definitely there sweeping the runway. Oops. That was the rocket engines. <laughs> and you can see the difference here. You can you can pretty much tell where the center of mass is by the way those the rocket engines on the bottom are gimbling, because the the one in the front is actually forward of the center of mass, so it doesn't do the same motions. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be thrusting properly. And there you go. Yeah, this is only on two engines. Another successful Kerbal design. Well, well. Some, somewhat, somewhat <laughs> successful. <laughs> yeah, good times. And now that we've flown around for a while, we've actually run out of fuel. And because it's such an amazing airplane... Oh, there we go. I lost a plane. Oh, it wouldn't be a Kerbal video without ending with some sort of disaster. Uh, this is It's a requirement, I think, under some sort of bylaw. I think it is, honestly. If there's not an explosion somewhere, you're not playing it right. All right, everyone. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.